So this brings us to the last talk of this session and uh, just 2018. It's on CIFA, which is Exploiting Ineffective Fault Inductions on Symmetric Cryptography. It's a joint work between uh, TUGRAS and Infineon, and the work will be presented by Robert Primus from uh, TUGRAS. Okay, uh, hello everyone, um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, as already mentioned, I'm going to talk about CIFAR, exploiting ineffective fault inductions on symmetric cryptography. And I would like to start this talk with a quick outlook. Um, so what I'm going to present is some kind of new fault attack that are um, quite hard to prevent in a sense that um, they defy both detection and infective countermeasures. And as a matter of fact, they also do, uh, can cope with mask implementations. However, um, this is actually covered in a follow-up work, um, which is why I'm not really going to cover it in this talk. Um, they're also quite versatile in a sense that they allow an attacker to induce forts at many different um, locations during the um, computation of some kind of cryptographic uh, um, function. And it even works with... Uh, quite a lot of different um, types of forts. Um, it's even applicable to quite a large variety of symmetric schemes. And as we will see, um, we've uh, um, evaluated um, this kind of fault attack on quite a variety of different platforms to basically prove that they are actually relevant in practice. So I would like to start with a quick introduction to fault attacks and especially countermeasures against fault attacks. So, um, what do you do in a fault attack? Well, basically, you have some kind of um, cryptographic implementation that you want to attack. And usually what you want to do as a first step is you want to be able to get some kind of physical access such that you can set, for example, plain texts and observe cipher texts. Then you want to induce some kind of fault into the computation such that you can observe a possibly partially or completely um, erroneous um, cipher text. And then what you usually do is you um, collect also a correct cipher text corresponding to the same plain text and determine um, parts of the key by doing a guess on a subkey and performing some kind of verification based on this pair of a faulty and the correct cipher text. Now, of course, this goes under the name differential fault attack and is uh, known quite well in the community. Now, usually, uh, we don't only consider attacks, but also countermeasures. So how do you uh, prevent yourself against such attacks? Well, the first and probably also um, quite effective uh, countermeasure would be to use some kind of um, redundancy to ensure that um, forts do not really af um, affect um, the computation. So what you could do, for example, is instead of computing your cryptographic implementation once, you could um, compute it twice, and at the very end, um, co simply compare the two outputs such that you only release it if actually both computations match up. By doing so, you can prevent yourself against attackers that just uh, induce a single fault in the computation. Now, of course, a, an attacker could do something like this and basically inject the same fault in both computations such that the result matches up and the faulty ciphertext is released. And in order to cope with that, you could do things like adding more redundancy or doing encryption, decryption, redundancy, um, using masking, etc. Now, there are also different kinds of uh, fault countermeasures other than detection-based countermeasures. For example, in, in an infection-based countermeasure, what you do, usually you also use some kind of redundancy, but also interleave computation and usually also dummy rounds. Um, I'm not going into too much detail here, but basically the idea is that um, once an attacker has uh, injected some kind of fault into a computation, this uh, countermeasure makes sure that this fault is in some sense amplified such that the output, the faulty output is not related in the, uh, to the key anymore. 
meaning that if an attacker will try to combine again a correct and defaulted cipher text, there's not really a meaningful way um, in how to do that. Um, now, of course, there are still attacks out there that could um, attack such a countermeasure, but they're usually quite hard and uh, require or have higher assumptions on the attacker. Um, apart from differential fault attacks, there is also um, quite a few other um, fault attacks in literature. So, for example, in 2007, uh, Clavier et al. proposed ineffective fault attacks. And the nice thing about those is that they actually exploit only correct ciphertexts. And by that I mean, of course, you want to check a fault somewhere, but every now and then a fault isn't actually causing a, a runoff computation. So, in some sense, it's uh, quite similar to a safe error attack. The problem with this um, attack is that it usually requires uh, precise faults and the effect of a fault has to be known by the attacker, which is not really always uh, the case in a practical scenario. Um, a quite different approach would be to use statistical fault analysis, um, as proposed by Fuhr et al. in uh, 2013. Here, uh, the nice thing about this attack is that it works with basically any type of fault, even if the attacker doesn't even know how this fault attacks, uh, affects the computation. The problem here is, however, that this uh, attack can be um, mitigated quite easily by using, for example, the detection or infection-based countermeasure that I have uh, presented just before. So, our idea was, um, can we somehow combine these two approaches such that we come up with a new kind of fault attack that has these both cool properties that we um, solely rely on the exploitation of correct ciphertext and still can work with quite a lot of different faults, even if we do not even know what they are doing. So, in order to explain how this um, statistical ineffective fault attack works, um, I want to stick to an example uh, on AES. So what we can see here on the white is just the last three rounds of AES. And one of the observations that we want to make here is that the distribution of st uh, state bytes, for example, in Route 9, uh, over the course of multiple encryptions is uh, uniformly distributed. Now, that's not really surprising, since AES is in pseudo random permutation, which means that this is basically uh, how we uh, expect such a function to, to operate. Now, what we want to do is now we want to induce a fault somewhere between mixed columns in round eight and nine. And the goal of this fault injection is to cause some kind of non biased, uh, sorry, non uniform distribution in uh, some, some parts of this AES state, for example, as illustrated here. And in order to do that, you have actually quite a lot of choices. You can work with stuckered forts, random forts, instruction skips, bit flips. And even when it comes to the granularity of the fort, you can target a single bit, a whole byte, uh, or, or even a couple of bytes. So the effect could really be like something like this, or like that, or like that. So you do not really care as an attacker, as long as there is some kind of non-uniform distribution. Now, as I mentioned before, um, we want to achieve a fault attack that actually works even in the presence of fault countermeasures, meaning that an attacker does not really get to see any faulty output. Now, an interesting observation that you can make here is that um, forts can even um, achieve this uh, property that we um, observe non-uniform distribution if we just uh, restrict ourselves to ineffective forts. So, the way to think about this is that um, if whenever we inject a fort, um, we may or may not receive a ciphertext depending on um, if the uh, fault has affected the computation or not, for example, in a redundancy-based countermeasure. So in a sense, you can think about this uh, scenario or the fault as some kind of filter that gives an attacker access to, to just a subset of all the possible correct ciphertexts, as illustrated here, for example. Now, how likely is it actually that um, an ineffective fault can cause some kind of non-uniform distribution in a state byte? Um, in order to convince you that this is actually quite likely, I have prepared a very simple example. So what we can see here is just a simple end gate, and um, we see basically two input bits that are uniformly distributed, and, and we want to explore how forts can affect the distributions of these inputs. So just for sake of simplicity, let's just forget about the output for now. And as a first example, let's consider bit flips. So what would happen if you, if an attacker actually injects or performs a bit flip on the first operand here? Now, um, it's actually quite, 
quite easy to see that if uh, input of an end gate here, for example, is uniform distributed, then a bit flip isn't really going to change its distribution. However, um, if we restrict an attacker to only observing these scenarios where a bit flip is ineffective, this basically means that the other operand has to be heavily biased towards zero, because every time we perform a bit flip in the first operand here, um, this basically means that we um, induce some kind of difference that has to be um, eliminated at some point. And this is only possible in this scenario if the other input is a zero, for example. Now, what about random forts? It's um, quite simple um, to see it again that the random fort doesn't really affect the first input because, by definition, if you randomize a bit, um, it's, just, uh, its distribution is still random and uniformly distributed. Now, again, if we just have a look at the ineffective um, uh, scenarios, we again see that the second input is heavily biased towards a zero. And the reason for that is simply that a random fault is nothing other than just a bit flip that occurs just in 50% of the cases, meaning that in a couple of cases, we need a zero to compensate this difference that we have introduced, and in, in the other cases, we do not. So, let's assuming that we have some kind of set of correct cipher texts that resulted from faulted encryptions, how can we actually use them to uh, recover a key? Well, that's quite easy and actually equivalent to how you would do it in a statistically fault attack. All you need to do is you want to guess 32-bit uh, of um, the round key in round, uh, in round 10, and then basically you want to reverse back to round 9, where you originally injected the fault. And then you can measure the uniformity of the state bytes using uh, an arbitrary matrix, for example, in our case, we use the squared Euclidean, uh, squared Euclidean imbalance. And what we should expect is for a wrong key candidate, we should expect that all the statements are distributed uniformly. However, for a correct can key candidate, we should expect that the distribution of the statements is not uniform, but actually some kind of non-uniform distribution. Meaning that, um, the key candidate that corresponds to the highest non-uniform distribution or the highest SAE in, in this example is most likely, the, most likely the correct one. So let's talk about a few of the practical results that we did. So for example, at first we targeted a simple software IIS implementation from the RVR crypto lab. And of course we implemented some kind of detection based countermeasure that ensures that no faulty cipher attacks are released. So, we injected um, forts via clock glitches uh, in round nine, and basically we observed that after for about uh, 1,300 faulted encryptions, we received about five correct cipher attacks. Now, how can I explain these numbers? Well, in this case, for example, our clock glitches um, caused some kind of stucked fault in one of the state bytes. And if you do that, then intuitively, uh, intuitively um, a fault is only going to be ineffective in about one out of 256 cases, meaning that if you want to collect about five correct cipher texts, you need about 1,300 um, faulted encryptions. And this was enough to um, recover qubits for this implementation. Now, we also performed the same experiment on another device, for example, an ATX Mega 256A3. This time, we didn't really target a software IIS implementation, but and hardware as coprocessor on this microprocessor. Now, as you can see, the numbers are qu quite different. The number of faulty encryptions is similar. However, the number of correct ciphertexts is quite different. So why would that be? Well, the problem here is we don't really know what our fault actually did to this implementation here for the hardware as coprocessor. So we cannot really tell. But all that we actually care about is that the attack works. So you can see. Even on quite different platforms, you can achieve similar results, even if you, don't, even if you, don't, even if you do not really know what your fault is actually doing. Um, now, I also talked about infection countermeasures at the beginning, so how about them? So, in order to test our attacks against infection countermeasures, we had a look at an implementation from uh, Mudre et al. And here, it's basically, we took a software IRS, and on top of that, we implemented this infection countermeasure. So, in this case, for example, um, this would mean that our IRS consists of 22 real rounds and 11 dummy, dummy rounds. And then the attack is quite the same as before. 
we simply try to find around 9 and inject some kind of fault in there. And what we can see, for example, in this case is that about uh, 6,500 faulted encryptions were necessary in order to gather about 225 uh, correct ciphertexts, which, uh, which was uh, sufficient to perform key recovery. Now, you can play around with the numbers here and increase the number of dummy rounds as you like. For example, if we use uh, 22 uh, instead of 11 dummy rounds, we can see that the number of 40 encryptions that are needed for the attack increases from roughly 6,000 to 9,000. And also for 66 dummy rounds, we see, for example, roughly uh, 46,000 for the encryptions that are needed in order to attack such an implementation. Now, in summary, uh, C4 is a new kind of fault attack that actually defines, uh, defies uh, popular fault countermeasures like detection and infection. It does require quite a lot more um, faulted encryption than, for example, a differential fault attack, but um, the nice thing here is that we only need one faulted encryption, uh, one fault per encryption, independent of how much redundancy is actually used in your implementation. Um, we also do not really need precise fault locations. There are basically very lot of choices when it comes to when or where you want to check your fault here. And as already shown, um, this kind of um, type of attack works with many different kinds of faults, even if it doesn't, if, if, even if the effect isn't really known to the attacker which also makes this probably a quite compelling choice for attacks against implementations where you do not even know the implementation. Now, there already exists um, two follow-up works to this, um, to this uh, paper, and one of those was presented at uh, SAC about a month ago. So there we had a look at authenticated encryption schemes, and even though we had a specific look at sponge-based schemes there, uh, really the takeaway uh, take message here is that this kind of uh, fault attack works against pretty much all of the authenticated encryption schemes, for example, all the C4 finalists, uh, uh, sorry, CISO finalists. Um, there is another follow-up work that will be presented at AsiaCrypt, and here we basically explore how this attack performs against implementations that use masking on top of having already some kind of fault countermeasure. And here the takeaway message is that it basically performs equally well with no real overhead, even if you just hit a single share of some kind of shared um, implementation. So essentially, this attack is uh, independent of the degree of masking and redundancy that you are uh, using in your cryptographic implementation. Um, thank you very much for your attention. So for the for the sake of time, we'll just take one question. Hello. Okay. So, um, would a counter a reasonable countermeasure for this attack just be that the um, the encryption module shuts down or refuses to use the key anymore once it detects one fault in the encryption? Yes. Sure. So. As you have seen, we need uh, quite a lot more um, faulted encryptions in order to get this working, for example, compared to a differential fault attack. So if you have some kind of mechanism that detects a certain number of faults and it is able to shut down the device or destroy it even, this could work, yes. But okay, it, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so, there's one more. The differential fault attack that you showed in the pop-up, please, slide number three, yeah. does it work for non-deterministic encryption schemas? Sorry, for what? Does it work for non-deterministic encryption schemes? I'm not sure, actually. Like so non when you encrypt like the cipher text? Encryptions with randomization. Right? Encryption with randomization, like... like non-deterministic, it means when you encrypt the same plain text, like multiple times, you get different ciphertext like each time. Like a CVC. Oh, you mean if differential fault attack works there or if CIFR works there? I mean, it's the same plain text. If you encrypt it like twice, yeah. you get different ciphertext. Yeah. So this attack also works in this case? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, okay. For okay. example, uh, if you look at the results here against uh, authenticated encryption, of course, some of them are non-spaced. And there you basically have to have this uh, property that, you know, 
not uh, uh, plain so it's never encrypted to the same ciphertext. Uh, yeah. Okay. So okay. sure. Thank you. So this is a ciphertext only attack. Yeah. So let's uh, thank the speaker for the sake of time. <laughs> <laughs>